So thank you for attending Beam Summit 2021. Um, let me give you a quick overview of who I am and my relationship to Beam uh, so you can get some sense of the, the biases I might be bringing to the table as I talk to you about deduplication. Um, so I, I am a, a data engineer at Mozilla, primarily working on the Firefox uh, data pipeline. So it is deployed on uh, Google Cloud Dataflow. Um, there's some details there about kind of the quantity of data that we're uh, processing in this pipeline um, and some details on this slide as well about kind of how I'm involved with Beam and how you can get in contact with me. And I'd be happy to have you know, follow-up conversations um, about this or about you know, kind of our, our Beam code base in general. Um, so objective of this talk, uh, kind of the, the big part is that we're going to compare robustness, performance, operational experience of deduplicating using the stuff that's built into Beam transforms versus going external, storing IDs in something like Redis, and why Mozilla switched from one approach to the other. And it may be not in the direction that you're expecting. Um, and I also want to point out that you know, our pipeline is open source on GitHub. Um, there's a link there. Uh, the Mozilla GCP ingestion uh, repository is a lot of what I'm going to be talking about um, today. And I'll give you some other links in these slides as well. And I'll you know, post these links to you after the talk in, in Slack, if not elsewhere. Um, so quick agenda here. We have about 20 minutes um, together, and then we'll take some questions. So I'm going to quickly talk about just the idea of duplicate messages and why you probably uh, have them in your pipeline. Um, I'll talk about Beam's built-in transforms for deduplication. Then I'll introduce this concept of end-to-end -end identifiers and why they are uh, relevant and useful for this problem of deduplication. Um, then I'll talk about you know when your needs you know exceed what can fit in internal state in a pipeline, uh, what it looks like to externalize that state using something like Redis, and finally we'll do a quick comparison of the different strategies we've talked about, and we'll take some questions hopefully. So last year at this conference, I uh, gave a more comprehensive you know, diagram of, of our pipeline and talked about you know, some aspects like how we handle errors, et cetera. Um, this year, I'm just showing you the happy path of, of our pipeline. Um, so the, the green boxes in there that have the little you know, Beam B next to them, those are you know, Beam pipelines running on Google Cloud Dataflow. The blue boxes are Google Cloud PubSub topics. And then you know, up at the top is you know, Firefox clients and you know, an HTTP service that we use to uh, accept telemetry. And if you think about this, every arrow in this diagram represents a distributed system that is sending messages over a network. And networks, even in the best case, have some amount of unreliability. And so there's, there's always got to be some measure of you know, flow control there and you know, what do you do if messages get lost as they're being passed around? So in practice, most systems, you have to make some trade-offs here. And they generally try to never drop a message. And that means that generally there is the possibility of double publishing messages. And you know, we call this at least once delivery. Um, and the Beam Java SDK has some built-in transforms that can help reduce this effect of you know, getting duplicate messages. So let's take a look at those first. Um, if you look through the vast selection of transforms that are uh, built in to Beam, um, you will eventually come across and you deduplicate and distinct. And those are both relevant to the problem we're talking about here. Um, but you know, what is the difference between these? Like the, the interface looks pretty similar too. Uh, so in the documentation uh, for these transforms, you'll find this, you know, this little blurb. Distinct guarantees uniqueness of values within a P collection, but may support a narrower set of windowing strategies or may delay when output is produced compared to deduplicate. What does that mean? Um, the big thing is here is how these are implemented is different between the two. So distinct is relying on Beam's windowing behavior. So it takes you know, whole windows of messages and ensures that only one copy of each message makes it out of the window. Um, deduplicate, on the other hand, is using Beam state. So it's keeping some set of keys or you know, messages that have been seen and then checking as new, new things come in. Um, and it doesn't necessarily you know, have to rely on, on windowing at all. In practice, uh, 
I have never actually used either of these in a pipeline. Um, and that is because Beam's IO machinery actually handles a lot of this under the hood and provides hooks for you to be able to do it. So for example, and, you know, we use PubSub IO um, in, in both of the streaming pipelines we're talking about here. And PubSub IO.read, if you read through you know, the Apache Beam code base and jump through a bunch of levels of indirection, you will eventually see that it actually does call uh, deduplicate under the hood. Um, to ensure that each message is read only once. And deduplicate actually assumes a, a 10 minute window. And again, it's maintaining state to do that um, within the pipeline. But if you're deployed on Dataflow like we are, the Dataflow runner actually pushes PubSub IO to a separate service. So the, you know, the open source implementation in the Apache Beam code base does not actually apply to Dataflow. Um, it's handling that for you. And so in, in the Dataflow case, the deduplication state is actually not consuming worker resources, which is which is nice. Um, so the code snippet below is from our GCP ingestion code base, and it implicitly includes deduplication. So if you look at pub sub IO dot read messages with attributes and message ID from subscription, um, none of that messages you, you mentions deduplication at all. Um, but it, it's happening implicitly under the hood. And you see that message ID part of it is that's a built-in part of PubSub. Every message that gets published gets assigned an ID. And if you consume messages, you can tell, you know, I got two messages with the same message ID, so I can safely throw one of them out. So let's zoom back out um, to looking at this whole pipeline. So we just talked about PubSub IO's uh, default behavior, and that is helpful uh, in, this, you know, in this diagram if we look at that raw topic to decoder job jump, and if you look at the decoded topic to republisher jump, you know, reading from PubSub in a, in a data flow pipeline, that's where that's relevant. Um, but <laughs> what about those initial hops from Firefox to our you know, HTTP edge service and then getting onto PubSub? Um, duplicates can happen there too. And it would be nice to be able to detect identical messages regardless of where the duplicate was in, introduced. Like just being able to handle that pub sub to, to data flow cases is not enough. So how are we gonna do that? Um, there's actually a hook for this. So on the previous slide, I lied to you and I deleted this extra little piece of, uh, you know, this method that's being called. So we, we actually call it with ID attribute and, you know, we, we pass in, there's, you know, an attribute of the, of the pub sub message that we want to use as the source for you know, deciding which messages are duplicates of, of each other. And I'll just discuss a little bit about, in our case, what we use for that. Um, so <clears throat> the Firefox telemetry API, um, so this is you know, an HTTP API, Firefox clients, you know, in order to submit telemetry, they hit you know, an HTTP service, and they use URLs that look like the ones in the, the example below. So uh, this URL scheme, uh, requires that the client include you know, a randomly generated UUID as part of the URL for each document that it sends. And we call this the document ID. And it serves as an end-to-end -end identifier for the document. So if we zoom back out again, um, you can now imagine, you know, what if we just don't worry about you know, deduplicating messages at all um, until the very end of this pipeline. So if what we care about in the end is consuming from this republished topic, we could actually you know, push all of our deduplication to the republisher. And in there, if we you know, use PubSub IO and we say, you know, look at the document ID attribute of the message, it's going to be able to you know, get only one copy of that message, regardless of whether the duplicate was you know, introduced you know, in Firefox sending to the edge service or if it was in mean, you know, any of those steps above. And that's the power of an end-to-end -end identifier is that you know, that document ID is coming from the original source of the message. And so even if we have imperfect de deduplication earlier, we can, you know, in this later stage of the pipeline, you know, deduplicate effectively regardless of which, which stage it was introduced in. Except if you remember, I mentioned that there's a 10 minute window for the state um, that's used for this, both for you know, Beam's built-in uh, deduplicate transform and for what Dataflow is doing. So imagine you have a Firefox client, it sends some telemetry, but then it crashes before it gets the acknowledgement. And then you start up Firefox an hour later and it resends that message. We've now passed outside of that 10 minute window of state. So 
you know, the republisher, you know, data flow job is not going to recognize that this is a message it's already seen. Um, it's already lost that state. So, you know, in that case, a duplicate, you know, will get through. So what if we care about that? Um, and we want to be able to consider a, a larger window. So there's there's only so far you're going to be able to get um, within a beam pipeline because you know, you have to maintain that state somewhere. It's eventually going to get too big um, to fit within your pipeline, and that's when you might want to you know, move it to some external state. And that also lets you you know have the the state you know, persist across pipeline restarts, etc. Um, so again, as as it becomes more central to what you need to do, uh, it's something you may want to consider. So when we originally implemented this pipeline uh, that I'm showing you here, we were migrating from a system in AWS that you know, happened to provide a 24-hour deduplication window. So we had that as part of our requirements. We wanted to provide you know, deduplication over you know, a 24-hour window like that. And so we decided to use an external Redis cluster in order to do that. So um, adding in here, uh, you'll see now we have Redis in this picture. And we have two arrows where we're communicating with it. So Redis provides a concept of expiring keys. And we were using it as a simple key set of you know, which document IDs have we seen in the past 24 hours. Um, we wanted to drop duplicates at the decoder stage. Um, but notice, you know, again, we do have these two different arrows where we're talking to Redis. So why is that? Why don't we just talk to it, um, talk to Redis in the decoder stage? Um, that is because. Uh, if you think about this, we only want to mark a message as seen once we're sure we have actually published it to that decoded topic. That's the output of the decoder job. And you know, Beam doesn't really provide us a hook to be able to you know, call out to Redis once you know, Beam is sure it's published something. So in practice, we need to actually consume that message off of the decoded topic. You know, if we're able to consume it, then we know it's actually been seen, and we're able to safely mark it as seen in the Redis cluster. So that's why you know, the republisher has to read this topic anyway in order to do what it's doing and then you know, outputting stuff to another topic. So the first thing we do in the republisher stage is you know, mark the message as seen in Redis. And then if a duplicate of that message hits the decoder, you know, it'll, it'll check Redis and see, OK, I've already seen this. I can safely throw away this message. So this system worked. Um, but as you might imagine, like this is adding significant complexity to the system. It's adding you know, a new data store, which we didn't really have uh, much familiarity with. And we need to, you, know, you need to think about fallback behavior. You know, what if Redis becomes unavailable? What does your pipeline do then? Do you just stop deduplicating and let everything through? Or do you fall back to some other behavior within Beam? Um, you also need to make sure that you know, your pipeline isn't going to get hung up uh, trying to communicate to Redis. And you know, in practice, we had that problem. Um, you know the code that we wrote to to contact Redis, you know, it would get it would get hung up. Our whole pipeline would be unavailable for for periods of time if the Redis cluster needed to you know undergo maintenance, et cetera. Um, also, it was expensive. We had to pay for a pretty large Redis cluster, and in practice, uh, we we decided at the end of the day that the impact for streaming applications of this you know larger window of deduplication really didn't warrant the investment. In maintaining that external state. So we have actually taken Redis out of this pipeline, and we now rely completely on that 10-minute window of deduplication built into Dataflow's PubSubIO. Um, but another you know, piece of this picture is that uh, you know, while we were dealing with these problems with um, Redis, we were making improvements in our data warehouse, which is like the real end use case. You know, for 90% of you know, our telemetry needs, what we're actually doing is in BigQuery, you're running historical queries um, where we really don't care about you know, the most recent data. And we had implemented a much stronger deduplication guarantee at the you know, BigQuery you know, data warehouse layer, um, which meant we really didn't need to worry that much about you know, de deduplicating within the streaming pipeline. So let me show you a little bit about. Uh, how we do that that stronger guarantee, like what that guarantee is, and how we implement it. So what you see on the right of this slide is um, a bunch of BigQuery standard SQL. Um, if you squint at that query a little bit in the middle, you can see we're reading from something we call a live table. And that's the thing that our you know, our Beam pipeline is loading into that you know every 10 minutes, something like that. Um, 
And we use this overall query to read from the live table and populate something we call the stable table for that document type. Um, and our stable tables for historical analysis are you know, populated once per day at 1 AM UTC. So we kind of give ourselves an hour to make sure that any late arriving data has probably made it through the pipeline at that point. And then we run this, this batch query over the entire you know, previous day of data. And we're able to write a guarantee that each document ID will appear only once <clears throat> per partition, you know, per day partition in this table. Um, and you can see the, the full code for this. This is a somewhat of a simplification, a simplification of it. Um, <clears throat> but you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot more value to analysts from a strong guarantee like this, whereas the streaming deduplication is kind of, it's always going to be best effort, um, which is really, it's really all you can achieve in a streaming pipeline. Um, but the this guarantee here is, you know, it's easy to write down in a sentence. It eliminates a like, common data cleaning step for analysts, and it really increases confidence in that historical data that we're providing um, for, for end users. So uh, kind of a moral of the story is where possible, use end-to-end -end identifiers to provide true end-to-end -end deduplication you know, in, in the final destination system where you know, users are, are getting the most value from the data. And if you have multiple different you know, end systems that are used for different things, you might want to consider you know, figuring out how to provide deduplication at each of those you know, end systems. All right, so our, our time is very nearly up here. Um, so I'm going to be very uh, reductionist here and try to you know, capture everything we've just talked about in, um, in a table here. So you know, along the top are the different, uh, so the columns here are the, the different you know, approaches to deduplication that we've talked about in this talk. On the left are different aspects of those um, that you might be interested in considering. So the time domain, is it using event time or processing time? Uh, the duration of the window that we're using for, for deduplication. You know, is this built in to uh, you know, the BM SDK, or is this you know, for external state? You kind of have to roll your own code uh, to do that. Um, worker resource consumption, you know, I want to just point out, again, if you're using these built-in transforms distinct or deduplicate, there is you know, memory that's going to be used on your, on your workers, and you may need to you know, think about sizing for that. Um, and then this last line here is something I have not mentioned uh, yet, um, and I wanted to touch on that, is monitoring the rate of duplicates. So something we liked about our, our system contacting Redis is that we were actually able to you know, have a metric, you know, a counter of like every time we you know, saw a message, determined it was a duplicate, and threw it out, we were able to you know, mark a counter. And so we could see you know, how often are we, are we throwing out messages due to this, and you know, is there something going, going strange with that? Um, the you know, the built-in transforms and Dataflow PubSubIO um, don't have a hook for publishing metric about that. Um, in practice, it's been fine, and we've never actually felt like we needed to have that number um, once we made the switch. But it was something that made us a little bit nervous when we were uh, removing Redis from the architecture. So I, I want to remind you again, um, so this, this code base is available um, publicly. Feel free to take a look, explore, um, and feel free to you know, contact me um, you know, in the future with, with questions about it or you know, ideas that you have. And you know, thank you so much for your time.